My name is Jordan, and I'm a freelance graphic designer who's always cherished the quiet company of pets over the bustling social life many others seem to relish. But recently, my serene life had been shattered by the disappearance of Whiskers, my beloved cat and constant companion. Whiskers wasn't just a pet. He was my confidant, always curled up on a corner of my desk, purring softly as I worked through my designs. Now, with every passing day, his absence gnawed at me, leaving a silence that was too heavy, too profound to ignore. I found myself staring out the window, scanning the neighborhood for any sign of him, hoping for his safe return, but also fearing what might actually lurk behind the veneer of our peaceful street. One restless night, as I lay awake tormented by thoughts of whiskers, my attention was drawn to a faint noise outside, a soft thudding, followed by the scrape of metal. Peering through the window, my eyes fixed on the backyard of Mr. Henderson, the neighbor directly across from me. Under the dim glow of the moon, I could make out his silhouette, moving with deliberate steps, burying something in the earth. It was late, much too late for any ordinary gardening. Mr. Henderson was a peculiar man, reclusive and reserved, with an air of aloofness that bordered on the unsettling. Rarely did he interact with others in Willowbrook Lane, and his presence was often marked by a polite nod or a curt wave, nothing more. Neighbors whispered about him, wondering about the solitary life he led behind the drawn curtains of his old Victorian house. That night, as I watched him pat down the freshly turned soil, a chilling thought crossed my mind. Could he be involved in Whiskers' disappearance? This question, once a mere whisper of a thought, now roared loudly in the silence of my heart. As the days passed, the unsettling calm of Willowbrook Lane began to crack, revealing a disturbing pattern. More pets had vanished. First, a spirited beagle from two doors down, then a pair of Siamese cats from the corner house. Each disappearance layered fresh anxiety onto our tight-knit community. Curious and desperate for answers, I started talking to my neighbors, piecing together the silent distress that connected us. Our casual conversations turned into meetings, where the air buzzed with theories and whispers of fear. Every story seemed to circle back to one common thread. The shadowy figure of Mr. Henderson, seen wandering at odd hours, always alone always returning to his solemn ancient house. Determined to unearth the truth, I decided to take a more proactive approach. One night, after witnessing Mr. Henderson's late-night activities, my suspicions deepened. He was burying something, again and again, always in the quiet cloak of darkness. The next day, fueled by a mix of fear and resolve, I went online and ordered a set of high-resolution cameras. When they arrived, I strategically positioned them to overlook Mr. Henderson's yard, ensuring a clear view of his nocturnal endeavors. This setup wasn't just to satisfy my curiosity. It was a necessary step to protect what was left of our community's peace, or perhaps to restore it. As I activated the cameras, I felt a surge of determination. Whatever secrets Mr. Henderson was burying in his backyard, I was going to expose them, not just for whiskers, but for all the pets and their owners who deserved answers. The surveillance cameras were up and running, a silent sentinel in the night. Positioned from my upstairs window, they offered a clear view into Mr. Henderson's mysterious backyard. Each night, as the neighborhood slept, I watched the screen of my laptop casting a pale glow in the darkened room. The footage was grainy, shadows playing tricks on my eyes. But soon enough, patterns emerged. Mr. Henderson was setting traps small, cleverly disguised mechanisms around his shed. Animals, lured by bait, ventured cautiously into his yard. I watched with bated breath as one after another. They disappeared behind the shed, the camera angle denying any further clues. My heart pounded not just with the thrill of the chase, but with a deep, growing dread. What was he doing to these animals? My need for answers became an obsession. One afternoon, I mustered the courage to confront Mr. Henderson directly. My knock on his door went unanswered, so I tentatively ventured around to his garage, which was slightly ajar. 
pushing the door open, I was not prepared for what I found. The walls of Mr. Henderson's garage were lined with paintings, each more disturbing than the last. They depicted animals, but not in any natural setting. These were surreal, almost grotesque portrayals of dominance and submission, with Mr. Henderson himself often painted as a towering figure overseeing trapped or cowering creatures. The artwork was skilled but dark, twisted in its themes and execution. Stunned by the discovery, I realized these paintings were a window into Mr. Henderson's psyche, revealing a deep-seated obsession with control and power over the helpless. This was no longer just about neighborhood pets going missing. It was about the twisted desires of a man who lived among us, his dark impulses hidden behind the facade of a quiet neighbor. My mission shifted profoundly. This was about exposing a danger, about saving future victims from his clutches. I spent hours diving deeper into Mr. Henderson's past. Online searches led to old newspaper articles and academic publications that painted a vivid picture. Mr. Henderson had once been a respected biologist, known for his controversial theories on animal behavior. His research, which focused on psychological manipulation and control, had eventually been discredited and dismissed by the scientific community for ethical violations. He'd vanished into obscurity until now, surfacing in our little neighborhood with his unsettling hobbies. I shared my findings with the community and the authorities. The revelations shook the community, but despite the growing concern, the tangible evidence of direct harm to the pets remained elusive. Without actual proof of mistreatment or harm, their reactions were mixed. Some were alarmed and supportive of further action, while others were skeptical, finding it hard to reconcile the quiet, solitary man they knew with the sinister figure in my findings. Frustrated, but undeterred, I approached the local police with the same evidence, from the surveillance footage, to the disturbing paintings, and his questionable past. The officers listened, brows furrowed as they reviewed the clips and photographs of the traps, the articles on his past research, and the photos of the eerie paintings. Yet, they were bound by the same frustrating constraints. Without clear evidence of criminal activity, or immediate threat, their hands were tied. They promised to keep an eye on Mr. Henderson and thanked me for the report, but I could tell they felt as helpless about the situation as I did. Feeling isolated in my quest, I realized that if anything was going to be done about Mr. Henderson, it would have to be by continuing my own investigations. I decided my next step would be to find out exactly what happened behind that shed, where the animals disappeared and the camera's eye could not reach. Deciding that the only way forward was to gather undeniable proof, I waited for the cover of night before slipping quietly into Mr. Henderson's backyard. The moon was a sliver in the sky, barely lighting my path as I crept closer to the infamous shed. Behind it, I discovered an elaborate setup of cages and traps, more sophisticated and disturbing than I could have imagined. Some were empty, eerily silent. Others held traces of recent occupants. Fur, a collar, a chewed piece of rope. As I documented everything with my camera, a sudden noise spun me around. Mr. Henderson stood at the back door of his house watching me. My heart pounded as our eyes met, and without a word, I turned and fled, scrambling over the fence just as he started towards me. I reported my findings to the police, but by the time they acted, Mr. Henderson had vanished, leaving behind his house and all his eerie belongings. Over the next few days, some of the missing pets began to return home, but their behaviors had changed. They were skittish, unnaturally quiet, almost as if they had been through trauma. Now, as I watch another neighbor closely, noting how they avoid certain areas of their yard or how they glance nervously towards Mr. Henderson's empty home, I can't shake the feeling that the fear and suspicion have rooted deeply in Willowbrook Lane. With Mr. Henderson out there somewhere, possibly continuing his experiments, the threat lingers, unresolved and menacing, a dark cloud over our seemingly peaceful neighborhood. When Mark and I decided to move into the duplex in what appeared to be a tranquil neighborhood, our hearts were full of optimism. It was a charming place, nestled on a leafy street lined with similar homes, 
each echoing the promise of peace and a fresh start. We spent our first few days unpacking, decorating and imagining our new life here, relishing the quiet and the soft rustle of the trees that whispered secrets from the past. But as night fell, the character of our new home seemed to shift. It started subtly, a strange creak here, a sigh there, sounds that one might put down to the settling of an old house. But then, the noises began to grow distinctly troubling. Heavy dragging sounds echoed through the walls from Mr. Wallace's side of the duplex, followed by muffled cries that chilled the blood and the occasional loud bang that would jolt us from sleep. The calm we had initially felt was swiftly replaced by a gnawing sense of dread. What was happening just beyond the walls we shared with Mr. Wallace? Each night, as these sounds pierced the stillness, our initial excitement turned to horror, and we knew we couldn't ignore it any longer. Something was terribly wrong, and it was happening right next door. Each night the noises grew worse, more frequent, and increasingly disturbing. Mark and I would lay awake, listening to the sounds that seemed to paint a picture of distress and fear. The heavy dragging that shook the walls, the muffled cries that seemed almost desperate, and the loud bangs that startled us from our thoughts. It all became too much. Huddled in our bed, we shared our fears. We need to find out what's going on for our own peace of mind, I whispered, and Mark nodded in agreement, his face shadowed with concern. The following day, with the sun high and a gentle breeze offering a false sense of normalcy, we attempted to approach Mr. Wallace. We caught glimpses of him through his curtains, but each time we knocked, he'd peer out, his eyes quick with something that looked like fear then disappear without opening the door. His persistent avoidance did nothing but heighten our suspicions and fears. We waited until we saw Mr. Wallace leave the house under the cloak of dusk, presumably for one of his rare outings. Seizing the opportunity, we hurried across to his unit. The front door was surprisingly unlocked. My heart pounded as I pushed it open, the familiar but now ominous creak sounding louder in my ears. We stepped inside, our nerves on edge as we prepared to uncover the truth behind the nocturnal disturbances that turned our dream home into a place of nightmares. The interior was dim, the only light filtering in through closed curtains. The noises had emanated from the basement, and that's where we headed, each step towards the basement door tightening the knot of anxiety in my stomach. Reaching the basement, we were met with a solid locked door. Heart racing, I looked at Mark who nodded silently before forcing the door open with a few strong kicks. The scene that unfolded before us was like something out of a nightmare. There, in a makeshift cell constructed with old rusted bars, sat a man. His clothes were tattered, his face drawn and haunted by shadows of despair. He looked up with wide, fearful eyes as we entered. Please, he rasped, his voice hoarse. You have to help me. He's keeping me here against my will. We hesitated, the gravity of the situation paralyzing us momentarily. But humanity overruled hesitation. We couldn't leave him in that dark, dank place. We found the keys hanging loosely on a hook nearby and unlocked the cell. As the man stepped out, stretching his limbs, a strange shift occurred. His demeanor changed, his gratitude fading into an unsettling confidence. You've done the right thing, he said. But the edge in his voice sent a chill down my spine. As we led him upstairs, he began to laugh quietly. You see, he didn't keep me here because he wanted to, he continued, his voice growing colder with every word. I made him, because if he didn't, things would get much worse for him. Mark and I exchanged a look of horror as it dawned on us. We hadn't freed an innocent victim, but had unleashed a dangerous fugitive who had been manipulating Mr. Wallace all along. The realization hit us like a wave of ice-cold water, and fear settled deep into our bones. What had we just done? He paced the living room, his movements jittery and unpredictable. I suppose I should thank you, he said, his voice dripping with sarcasm. But I'm not sure you've really thought this through. His gaze fixed on us sharp and calculating. 
It was then that he lunged towards us, a wild look in his eyes. The fugitive shouted threats, his words a tangled mess of warnings and malice. We burst out of the house, not stopping until we were safely in our own home, where I immediately called the police. My hands trembled as I explained the situation, the phone nearly slipping from my grasp. Within minutes, sirens filled the quiet street, a stark contrast to the deceptive peace of earlier days. Police cars pulled up, and officers rushed into Mr. Wallace's home just as he arrived back, his face contorting with anger and confusion when he saw the commotion. Mr. Wallace was detained and questioned, right there in the street. Surrounded by police, he looked defeated and terrified. I had no choice, he pleaded with the officers. He threatened to hurt my family if I didn't help him hide. I've been living a nightmare trying to keep everyone safe. The officers listened intently, taking notes as Mr. Wallace recounted how the fugitive had manipulated him, using threats to turn his home into a prison for both of them. His story spilled out, a mix of fear and desperation that painted a vivid picture of his ordeal. As he spoke, it became clear just how complex and dangerous the situation had been. Far beyond anything Mark and I could have imagined when we first heard those disturbing noises. In the aftermath of that terrifying night, the fugitive somehow managed to evade capture and remained at large. The police scoured the neighborhood and beyond, but he had disappeared without a trace, leaving a trail of anxiety and fear in his wake. Mr. Wallace, meanwhile, was taken into custody. Although he was a victim in his own right, the complexities of his involvement required further examination by the authorities. The neighborhood reeled in shock, neighbors exchanging uneasy glances and whispered speculations about what else might have been lurking beneath the surface of our quiet streets. For Mark and I, life never quite returned to normal. The shadows in our home seemed darker, each creak and whisper of the house a constant reminder of the horrors we had unwittingly unleashed. We fortified our home, installed new locks, and yet the sense of security we once took for granted had shattered irreparably. After a year of battling the noise and chaos of city life, I, Aaron, moved to the quiet embrace of a suburban town. My new home, with its wraparound porch and flowering dogwoods, seemed perfect to mend a spirit worn by life's upheavals and to reignite my passion for writing. Mr. Thompson, my next door neighbor, presented a stark contrast to the vibrancy of our surroundings. A solitary figure, he seldom ventured beyond the confines of his modest, neatly kept bungalow. Our few exchanges consisted of polite nods, his gaze always quick to retreat back to the safety of familiar solitude. He intrigued me, an enigma resting quietly. But tranquility soon gave way to mystery as I began finding pieces of a manuscript in my mailbox, each arrival unannounced, each piece exquisitely crafted. These segments, while beautifully penned, narrated chilling stories of disappearances within our very town. With each page, the stories wove themselves deeper into the fabric of local lore, their details mirroring unsettlingly precise accounts of events that, to my growing horror, I discovered had actually occurred. The realization that these narratives might be more than mere fiction sent a shiver through me, the shadow of something sinister beginning to loom ever closer. The manuscripts became my obsession. Each page pulled me deeper into a labyrinth of historical truths and fictional horrors, blurring the lines between the two. I pored over local archives and town records, matching the chilling tales in the manuscripts to actual disappearances that had haunted the town decades ago. Every correlation I discovered sent a cold shiver down my spine, the echo of those lost souls whispering through the pages. But what began as a morbid fascination quickly turned to sheer terror. The latest manuscript pieces began to describe disappearances that were not just historical, but current, mirroring headlines from recent weeks. The precise details it contained, the color of a missing woman's coat, the exact location a child was last seen, were reported with unnerving accuracy. It dawned on me that these were not merely reflections of the past, 
but chilling announcements of ongoing horrors. Driven by a mix of fear and duty, I took the manuscripts to the local police station. But my concerns were met with skepticism. The officer, a middle-aged man with a weary gaze, dismissed the manuscripts as a strange coincidence, or perhaps someone's idea of a distasteful prank. People have too much time on their hands, he concluded, sliding the papers back across the desk to me. Frustrated but undeterred, I returned home to find another piece waiting in my mailbox. This manuscript was different. It described a disappearance that hadn't yet been reported. When the news broke the next day, a cold realization settled in. The manuscripts weren't just recounting past events or observing current ones. They were predicting them. This predictive pattern shook me to the core. It was clear I was dealing with something far beyond a mere storyteller. The question now was, how deep did this dark thread run, and what would it unravel next? Confronting Mr. Thompson was inevitable. With the latest manuscript clutched in my trembling hands, I marched next door, driven by a mix of dread and determination. He answered the door with that same withdrawn demeanor, his eyes flickering with an unreadable emotion as he saw the papers in my grip. I know what you've been doing, I accused, my voice steadier than I felt. His reaction was chillingly calm, a slight smile playing at the corners of his lips. Ah, the power of storytelling, he mused, his voice smooth, almost reflective. To create worlds, fates, and histories. My goal, dear Aaron, was always to craft unforgettable fiction. His cryptic words hung heavy between us, and before I could press further, he gently shut the door. The next morning, chaos enveloped our quiet street. Police cars and an ambulance crowded in front of Mr. Thompson's house. He was found in his study, an apparent suicide, with a note confessing to the orchestration of various disappearances chronicled in his manuscripts. But something about the note struck me as off. It was too neat, too contrived. The details in his confession lacked the depth and particularity that marked his manuscript narratives. It was as if the person who wrote the note had only a superficial knowledge of the actual events. Fueled by this inconsistency, I dove back into both the manuscripts and the so-called confession. Comparing them side by side, the discrepancies became apparent. Certain dates didn't match, and the descriptions of the victims in the note were vague lacking the vividness that his writings usually portrayed. It seemed more like a final hasty attempt to close the story rather than a genuine admission of guilt. The police, satisfied with the closure of the case, moved on. But I couldn't let it go. Something deeper, more sinister was at play, and I felt compelled to uncover the truth. If Mr. Thompson was indeed the author of the horrors, why the discrepancy in his final note? And if he wasn't, who penned that confession? And why? The mystery only deepened, urging me to look beyond what was readily apparent. The tranquil illusion of our small town shattered once again when a new disappearance had showed the sinister pattern of Mr. Thompson's manuscripts. This time, a young man vanished it after a late shift at the local diner. A scenario detailed in the manuscript I received the very next morning. The chilling precision of the events so distinctly described in the manuscript, and now unfolding in real life, confirmed a horrifying truth. The story was far from over. Gripping the latest manuscript, the dread I felt was palpable. This wasn't just the continuation of Mr. Thompson's dark legacy. Someone else was orchestrating these events, using his disturbing narratives as a blueprint. But who? And why continue this macabre series after Mr. Thompson's death? These questions haunted me, spurring me into action. My investigation took on a new urgency as I combed through the manuscripts for clues that might indicate what or who might be next. I mapped out the locations mentioned, the profiles of the victims, anything that could give me a lead. But this deep dive into the manuscripts, while necessary, began to draw unwanted attention. The police, observing my increasingly erratic behavior, and my frequent visits to the scenes described in the stories grew suspicious. To them, 
My extensive knowledge of the cases and my proximity to Mr. Thompson painted a troubling picture. Despite their growing suspicions, I couldn't stop. I knew another event was imminent, and I felt a deep responsibility to prevent it. This wasn't just about clearing my name anymore. It was about stopping a cycle of terror that had gripped our town. As the shadows lengthened, the line between my fiction-fueled investigations and stark reality blurred. One evening, as I returned home from canvassing the area of the latest disappearance, I felt the unmistakable sensation of being followed. Turning into an alley as a shortcut, I was suddenly confronted by a masked figure. The scenario was sickeningly familiar, lifted straight from one of the manuscripts. Heart pounding, I managed to evade my assailant, escaping through the serpentine back streets. The realization hit me hard. The threat was not only real, but alarmingly close. Was it someone from the local police, disgruntled and deranged? Or a shadowy figure from our seemingly tranquil community? Shaken but undeterred, I compiled all the evidence I had gathered. Surveillance footage, a timeline of discrepancies in the manuscripts versus the confession, and testimonies from those who had known Mr. Thompson. Presenting this to the police finally swayed a few skeptics in the force. They agreed to reopen the investigation, acknowledging that the threat was external and far from over. The manuscript saga did not end with Mr. Thompson's death. It continued, each new part arriving with unnerving punctuality. The final piece appeared on my doorstep, not mailed as before, but placed there, as if to taunt. The story within predicted another event, this time eerily detailed, as if challenging me to stop it. I stood at my window watching the quiet street, the manuscript in hand. The night was still, but the silence was deceptive, charged with the latent threat of the next chapter. I was no longer just a novelist. I was a sentinel at the edge of a dark abyss. My life had transformed into a narrative I had no control over, but I was ready. Ready to face whatever, or whoever, came next. With each rustle of the trees, each shadow that flicked across my porch, I was reminded. This was not the end, but possibly the beginning of my own story within his grim anthology.